Lord, as dawn breaks through, gently erasing the darkness of the night, heralding the start of our new day, enable us to do the same, rising out of the darkness of our night into the light of your revealing love. Amen. Please be seated. I appreciate those of you who are wearing pink in solidarity with me today. Thank you for that. We have another week where we are talking about John the Baptist. Where, where are the stories about Jesus, you might be asking. Isn't it Advent and aren't we supposed to be getting ready for the Jesus story? But that is exactly what John's job is, getting us ready to meet Jesus. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let me do a little background first. You all know I love to do a little context. Like all the other Gospels, the Gospel of Luke does not contain the author's name. That may be a surprise to some. You see, it is anonymous. Like the other Gospels, Luke received a title in the second century when the four canonical Gospels were selected from many others for inclusion in the canon. Though he remains anonymous, I shall call him Luke to keep it simple. While we don't know his name, let me share a few details that we do have about Luke. First, he wrote excellent Greek and was a far superior writer than those working on the other Gospels. Clearly, he was someone of high education. He uses terms of trade that indicate that he was likely a physician. And he was a world traveler, talking about the many places he went. And for a time, he traveled with Paul in his ministry. He was a Gentile, and he wrote to a Gentile Christian audience. He is also the author of the Acts of the Apostles, and in thus doing so, writing both this gospel and that, he was truly prolific in his writing. He wrote, you see, 27.5% of the entire New Testament, more than any other person. His impact on the New Testament was truly profound. But there was one thing that we cannot say about Luke. He was not an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry. He was a contemporary of Paul, and he retold stories that had been told to him. Luke begins with the story of John the Baptist. All the Gospels mention John, but only Luke tells the origins of John's birth. The other Gospels start with John being out there in the wilderness, being so John, yelling and screaming and wearing camel's hair and eating locusts and honey. But not Luke. He does not rush us into that heart of the story, but prepares the way slowly just as John prepares the way for Jesus. We're accustomed to the uniqueness of Jesus' birth, aren't we? But John comes into this world in a miraculous way as well. Luke tells us that his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were of great age and without children. Truly a devastating situation in their time in history. Zechariah was a priest and he and his wife lived a life of reverence of God, not just in words, but in actions as well. The angel Gabriel, yes, the angel of Gabriel, who would later appear to Mary, appears before Zechariah and tells him something unbelievable, that they will have a son Zechariah is astonished because he and his wife 
are so old. You see, even John's birth announcement foreshadows Jesus' own. But we don't stop here with that overlap. Remember, Elizabeth is a cousin of Mary. John is born about six months before Jesus, and they grow up together, or at the very least, see each other at family gatherings and religious holidays. But John has another distinction to note. He is, you see, the last great prophet of old. He stands at the end of a long line of great prophets, like Moses, Isaiah, Amos, Eli, and Daniel, to name but a few. All these prophets have pointed people to God, and many have pointed to the Messiah to be born in the distant future. John gets the wonderful honor of not only announcing Jesus' coming, but introducing him to his own followers and saying, this is he of whom I have spoken. In today's reading, John doesn't hold any punches, does he? You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Here the Greek word for repentance means change of mind. So instead of just feeling sorry for your actions, it calls for a revolution in your thinking and ultimately affects a change of direction in your life. We all have to ask, what motivates our faith? Is it fear of the future or a desire to be a better person in a better world? Some people were coming to John then, and quite frankly, come here today for baptism so that they can escape some kind of eternal punishment for themselves or for their babies. But this baptism for them doesn't result in any change towards God. John lets them have it. You brood of vipers. Tough language then, tough language today. So I ask, is our faith motivated by a desire for a changed life, or is it some kind of heavenly insurance policy? Should we be caught off guard? I think that's what John's story is all about. But he doesn't just ask that question, what motivates you? He proposes some proper actions, doesn't he? Whoever has two coats, he says, must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. And those who work with the any given social structure of their day, well, in this case, it was tax collectors and soldiers, but it could be politicians of our day. They're told to operate with justice and compassion to others. I don't know about you, but when I see a mission statement for a company, I never see those words. To operate with justice and compassion towards others. When I hear political slogans, I never hear one say, to operate with justice and compassion for others. Perhaps some repentance is needed. We are to look, folks, for ways to show justice and compassion to those with whom we come into contact through our social and our work interactions, whether they're Christian or not. We are to show justice and compassion. John's message demands three things. Share what you have with those in need Whatever your job is, do it well and with fairness. And finally, 
Be content with what you have. It's a tough one in 21st century America, isn't it? Be content with what you have. John did not have time to mince words, and he doesn't. He knew Jesus was coming, and he wasn't going to offer comforting platitudes to those who lived careless or selfish lives. He spoke with such a sense of urgency because, you see, he was preparing people for the Messiah. His words remain as fresh for us today as they did for the audience who heard him speak it that first day. So in the season of Advent, the season of anticipation of God doing something new in our world, think and pray hard, folks, and ask, what is God calling you to do? If you do, then you really are preparing yourself for Jesus' arrival. Amen.